Ciao, here is a conversation with Igor Mesic. So uh, today I really don't have a presentation. I've just finished recording the episode. I'm really excited because it was interesting. And so I decided to convey the excitement instead of uh, writing things down and reading them. Um, so the conversation was insightful, uh, technically speaking, because uh, the work of Professor Mesic is relevant for my research. Um, but also I would say it was interesting in terms of ethics and meaning. Uh, what's the position, what's the place for science, for, for men in the universe, but also for, for a scientist in the universe. Um, and it was also philosophically deep, I would say, we touched on the, the implications of his operator perspective um, of dynamical systems on the stochastic appearance of uh, quantum mechanics. And uh, I think his perspective is particularly compelling. We also talked about the relation between the recurrence theorem in the measure preserving dynamical systems and the philosophy of Nietzsche, uh, in particular the eternal return, uh, what that means for uh, the ideas related to the multiverse. And that was really interesting. Uh, then, of course, we talked about the, the, the importance of uh, Koopman theory in dynamical system theory, also in data-driven dynamical system theory, so not necessarily, for example, Hamiltonian systems, uh, but more general ones. Uh, we talked about time delay embedding, uh, so how to get rid of the Markovian assumption about nature and how is this powerful to model it. Uh, we talked about uh, complex system theory, how this operator's perspective can be useful in that regard. Um, we talked about, of course, the implications of his ideas for celestial mechanics and aerospace engineering in general. And so, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the episode as well. If you like it, uh, put a thumbs up, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, then please subscribe, uh, sorry, follow me on Twitter, follow me on LinkedIn, uh, support me on Patreon, and enjoy the episode. The schedule is like a, a draft of things I'm interested in, uh, things I, I think resonate with your work, at least the things that came in my mind looking into your work. But if we end up talking about, for example, energy efficiency and uh, the human condition, I'm more than happy to explore that as well. Those are those are the difficult topics, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, just today I was thinking about, I was talking to colleagues about, uh, yeah, defining some I mean, I have a philosophy book in my bed uh, side, uh, defining why working in technical things. And uh, uh, yeah, I don't even know how to express that. The nature of sacrifice in technical, in a technical career, something like that. Um, uh, that's a great topic. Probably <laughs> a, a topic for a for a for a, for a different podcast. But in my view. Um, it's difficult to call it a sacrifice. The reason being that people who go into these types of careers are usually very passionate about that type of a career. I don't, I don't think it's the only career that people in technical professions were able to pursue, but they decided to go to this one because they were passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the sacrifice is, is a word, uh, but, but also the, these kinds of elements come because of passion some sort of obsession with yeah with the you know for for many people i think making the world better through through technology and i'm i'm certainly an optimist with respect to that I'm not I, I i i think we've been able to you know control the advancements in in technology with of course um some terrible periods where we didn't but mm -hmm. hopefully hopefully we learn from it anyhow that's my comment on yeah <laughs> okay you know, yeah i guess it's a it's a good starting point also you mentioned before we started recording your interest in energy efficiency and the impact of your research as a whole uh so maybe we before i start asking what's koopman theory and all of that maybe you can say a bit more about your practical the, the practical interests you have for your work it, it's it's interesting because we will talk i think for the rest of the discussion on, on koopman, koopman theory but my interest and my 
let's say obsession with, with the Koopman theoretic uh, type uh, approach really came in a big way from a practical standpoint. So maybe I'll describe the following. I certainly used Koopman operator theory in, in my thesis way back, you know, 90, 90 to 94 at Caltech. Mm -hmm. uh, I used it to detect invariant sets. Right. And I think we'll talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, and I used it specifically to compute invariant sets that are not smooth. So in chaotic systems that might have fractal, you know, invariant okay. subsets, subsets and so on. So that's where my initial interest started from. But but it did come from an applied question, which is, you know, can you find invariant sets in fluid flows? Mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. was the question of the time, chaotic advection and, and those sorts of mm -hmm. problems. But later on, I uh, worked with a, a friend and colleague of mine at, at United Technologies Research Center. United Technologies is now Raytheon. It's, it's one of the biggest companies in the world in, let's say, mechanical engineering space. Mm -hmm. They have... Uh, Pratt and Whitney um, um, jet engines, and they used to have you know all these elevators. They, they restructured, so I, I don't know all the details of of uh, various technologies. But I spoke to them quite a bit, consulted for them, and it turned out that the current methodologies in control and systems theory were not quite capable of capturing some questions or answering some questions, like, oh, if if I have a, a, a tabletop version of my jet engine, so scale down, uh, and I detect an instability, is the same thing going to happen on a, on a big engine? How can I detect this? Is it a real instability? I mean, is it, mm -hmm. is it just cycling with a lot of noise or a real instability, like a very noisy hop bifurcation, right? So mm -hmm. transition to a limit cycle, some large scale oscillations. And so it turned out that the Koopman operator theory helped me answer that question as well. And that was related to another eigenfunction, not the eigenfunction that defines invariant sets. And so mm -hmm. I kept thinking about these things. Then Koopman modes, you know, I, I found this concept of Koopman modes mm -hmm. uh, and thought, oh, this could be useful because people are trying to decompose fluid flows. Mm -hmm. So honestly, while some aspects of this were, you know, a lot of aspects of this are still proving theorems. I mean, being very mm -hmm. rigorous about it, my own motivation in a lot of cases came from understanding that if I solved that particular problem, I could have an impact on a, on a very applied problem. And then almost invariably, I found a solution in somewhere in Koopman operator theory in various mm -hmm. different aspects of it. And so right. that's a little you know brief history of how it came about for me. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um... It's nice also to see the interplays between uh, different uh, technical fields, let's say, and how in particular, I mean, at least for me, the, the influence of fluid dynamics in celestial mechanics has been growing and growing uh, in the last decades. I mean, this goes back to Zubehe that wrote in the 60s a book in, with, with a section specifically mentioning the, I think, the fluid dynamics equivalence, something like that. Um, yes. uh, but I mean, more and more also... Um, it's interesting to see that uh, uh, while dynamic mode decomposition came out independently in some sense yes. from Koopman operator theory, it was still applied to fluid dynamics and it was still shown to be uh, applicable to a, a number of ranges, uh, a ranges of dynamical systems. So, um, yeah, maybe we could start talking a bit about uh, the, the application of Koopman theory. First of all, what Koopman theory is, and then the application of it for the detection of invariant sets. Okay, so um, fundamentally speaking, uh, Koopman operator theory is the theory that describes, in modern view, the, the theory that describes uh, data evolution or evolution of time dependent processes um, using observables on those time dependent processes. And I'm being very intentional in not saying start with a dynamical system, mm -hmm. you know, start with a state space and then figure out some observables in the state space. For example, pressure is an observable, pressure at the point is an observable in, in a combustion chamber. Uh, 
I'm, I'm being very intentional not to start from the state space because to me, really, it's an operator on the collection of observables mm -hmm. uh, that we have. And to start with, that can be extremely broad. Just imagine all the different observables that you can extract or, 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 or uh, measure uh, from a given, given process. The power of it stems from the fact that even if you had a single observable, and this is a very nice close connection to classical dynamical systems theory in the form of Takens theorem, even if you had a single observable, this is a useful framework. Namely, mm -hmm. taking a sufficient number of time delays, given that might be infinity, but let's talk about this a little further. Mm -hmm. And you will see that in, in many cases, it's finite. Um, it, one can construct a theory, a model. And so the way I view it today is really as, as an exceptionally good modeling tool in the era where you know we are thinking that everything is going to be modeled by neural networks, I think the operator theoretic model is the starting point and the neural networks are elements of functional approximation that can be used to fill the gaps, mm -hmm. to, to use instead of you know, Fourier transforms and things like that, that, that we used in the past to provide approximations. Mm -hmm. So, um, so just, just to kind of summarize, um, I view it today as a modeling theory, although it did come out from trying to describe an alternative point of view to state space methods. Mm -hmm. the, 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 right. the, truth, the truth of the matter is that it can describe processes that are not amenable today. We cannot really write down a model. And that's an important distinction to me because we are using it in a different way than, you know, the the, the luminaries, the Koopman and von yeah, Neumann, yeah. uh, really really envisioned it. We are actually using it in a in a in a different, I would say, powerfully different way. Mm -hmm. And of course, they didn't have access to computers, although von Neumann invented the architecture. But you know, they they didn't have the same uh, the same uh, benefits of. Of, of development that, that we have. Mm -hmm. Right. And how is this related to invariant sets? So uh, one of the first and interesting things, and that does come from Koopman and von Neumann um, original paper, oh, Koopman paper in, in 1931, and then follow up with von Neumann, is that I was asking this question <clears throat> in conservative systems, so in, in systems that pres preserve measure, Okay, we know in some cases, for example, for Hamiltonian systems that you have this nice smooth invariant, which is the Hamiltonian. But there are many other invariants, especially in chaotic systems, there actually still are many invariants besides the Hamiltonian, typically. What I realized is that one can actually characterize all the invariants of a dynamical system uh, from the eigenspace at one for discrete time systems of the Koopman operator associated mm -hmm. with that system. And, and now we're starting from state space, really. Um, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is 1990, 1992, was mm -hmm. a long time ago. Um, and then the idea was, well, if you can do that, just put the basis on the state space, find the invariance by using time averaging. That's another thing that, that generalized very nicely today. Mm -hmm. I was in my thesis. And if you take an arbitrary function and find its time average along the trajectories and associate with the initial condition, you get a new function, mm -hmm. right? So take an initial condition, take the time average of an arbitrary function, non-constant, arbitrary function along trajectories, and associate the value that you get of the time average with initial condition. Interestingly, the associated function of initial condition is an invariant. And that relationship is one-to-one. -one. So all the invariants are in fact time averages of functions and pretty much obviously time averages of functions are actually invariants. So that gives one a nice characterization of all the invariants pretty much an arbitrary measure preserving dynamical system. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really have to be 
you have to be um, Hamiltonian. And if you apply this, as we did later, to dissipative systems, you actually find basis of attraction, or, or rather, you find indicator functions on basis of attraction. So you can extend it to dissipative systems. Um, right. So yeah, that, that, that provided the first insight into saying, oh, <clears throat> this could be useful because time averages can be obtained from data. If you're observing mm -hmm. something, the only thing that you need to have the ability to do is prepare your system from different initial conditions, right? Mm -hmm. so you have access to a number of different experimental initial conditions, or for that matter, if your trajectory goes to a sufficient number of initial conditions, you will know uh, some aspect of, of invariant, of the invariant structure. Uh, and and since, since those time averages that can be obtained from data give you eigenfunctions, then it's a natural question, well, how about other eigenfunctions? These are mm -hmm. eigenfunctions at one, right? At the, the, so, so how about the other eigenfunctions? And that's, that's what I proceeded to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, and uh, as you said, this not only does not apply only to Hamiltonian <laughs> systems, uh, because it applies in general to measure preserving, also dissipative ones, um, to some extent. Uh, this implies also that it's not necessary for the system to be geometrically similar, so different market to a linear one, but it can be a general one, any way a chaotic one. Yeah, this is a great question because I find a lot of confusion out there, even from people, you know, that have very very strong background. There is this impression that oh, the system needs to be <laughs> globally linearizable in in order for this to work. That's patently not true. You can mm -hmm. you can have systems with a variety of different basins of attraction. A system with a variety of different basins of attraction. You can to start with. You can answer the question. Well, you know, can you characterize the basins of attraction in the observable space, or mm -hmm. the other way around? Can you use the observables and measurements to characterize basins of attraction? And here we are talking about all the way to chaotic attractors. There is really no, no um, real um, restriction, restriction there. The other aspect is, you know, how, how does this apply to uh, chaotic attractors? And the aspect, that is, I think, not so well understood, although we've written it in papers since a long, long time ago, is that <clears throat> there is a very, very nice splitting that happens in Kuban operator theory. You have to set up appropriate function spaces in order for it to work. But once you do, there is a very nice splitting between what I would call a, a regular part of dynamics that contains both transient transients and perhaps quasi-periodic motions. Mm -hmm. Quasi-periodic, including fixed points, which is quasi, you know, periods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, period zero. But limit cycles, quasi-periodic attractions, any, anything regular of that type. And I'm simplifying because I'm not talking about exact technical conditions, but those types of systems, they are all characterized by point spectrum and even some transient dynamics point spectrum of, of the operator. The chaotic parts of the dynamics are contained in the, in, the continuous, in the continuous part of the spectrum. And so in order to understand the properties of chaotic attractors actually beyond saying the attractor is mixing, that's a great statement. It took, it took mm -hmm, a, mm -hmm. a very, very long time to prove it. And it's a brilliant accomplishment by uh, Luzato and, and Melbourne, and I believe, or the co-authors and that. But you can ask the question, well, is there something within that mixing dynamics that is coherent, at least on finite time scales? Mm -hmm. And what we discovered recently, this is perhaps three, four years ago, is that there is. So for example, in the pseudo spectrum of the Koopman operator, so you don't have eigenfunctions, we know that, okay. but in the pseudo spectrum of the operator, there are these pseudo eigenfunctions that when you look at their contour sets, they actually give you the partitioning 
of the of the of the attractor itself, in which you literally see coherent structures. Okay. So this is this is now a little bit of a sub theme. So the first paper on this is by uh, Milan Korda and uh, Mihai Putina and myself, I believe, and then mm -hmm. Dimitri Giannakis right. um, uh, published a paper in which he found it with compactification methods. And um, now I think there is a variety of interest in this particular topic as to how do you characterize chaotic attractors beyond their mixing property. And the Koopman operator theory might have some unique answers to that. It's a little bit difficult to see how exactly you get this from pure trajectory analysis. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And I think this is again relevant for celestial mechanics because uh, I mean, again, from Zbehe, there's a paper late nineties about the papers for the next millennium. And one of these was about the, the use of ideas from uh, statistical mechanics. So for example, one of these could be considering not single trajectories, but ensembles and consider, uh, keep, keep forward this, this, this jump from Newton to Poincaré, even forward in some sense, uh, to stop considering uh, um, single trajectories, but look at the geometry and from there, even the, um, yeah, and then I would say introduce this functional analysis inspired perspective that allows one to uh, look for, um, for for things that are even deeper in the dynamics. Uh, I mean, I, I'm lost because I'm thinking about uh, the works of Giannakis I read, but they're really a bit above my head at this moment. So, um, but yeah, I would say it's definitely an interesting perspective that raises the question whether uh, chaos is a manifestation of stochasticity in some sense of noise or the opposite. So uh, do you think there's some value in doing the opposite in, uh, in stochastic dynamical systems? So to consider it as the appearance of, of chaos in some sense. Yeah, let, let me comment on, on two different things. One is, uh, you know, ergodic theory in itself, which arose right after Perkov proved the ergot, you know, the famous pointwise mm -hmm. ergodic theorem, and then for Neumann proved the uh, uh, theorem in the mean. Um, it is basically where this point of view started. If you look at Koopman and von Neumann, I believe the paper came out in 1932, analyzing dynamical systems with continuous spectrum, you will see them saying that the underlying system has as chaotic a trajectory as any stochastic system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the theory of chaos, chaos, of course, took off in 63 with, with Lorentz because he found this strange behavior, chaotic behavior in a, in a physical system. So mm -hmm. that, that meant a lot. But if, if you look at whether Koopman and von Neumann, for example, knew that you can have chaotic dynamics in deterministic dynamical systems, uh, you know, they certainly did. And they, they did it from the perspective of, they understood it from the perspective of Koopman operator theory and the fact that systems could have could have a continuous spectrum. And I do think it was pretty clear to them that the analysis from the perspective of invariant sets, invariant quantities, you know, eigenfunctions and so on would be fruitful in contrast with uh, you know just understanding of trajectories. I, I think mm -hmm. that was in, implicit. Okay. Or, or oh, in some in some places pretty explicit, explicit yeah. and the ergodic theory the ergodic theory took up that point of view. So mm -hmm. if you look at the theory of partitions in ergodic theory, that I ended up expanding to you know dissipative systems, uh, and and defining things like transient uh, transient uh, partitions, which uh, not, I'm not quite there in in, in measure preserving systems. They looked at dynamical systems from the using the lens of partitions, so groups of trajectories, not, mm -hmm. not and positive measure groups very often, right? Of trajectories mm -hmm. rather than rather than a single trajectory. The, you know, one of the most influential books, I would say, in dynamical systems was that of Lasota and, and Mackey. Mm -hmm. uh, on on uh, that essentially contained a probabilistic 
point of view on deterministic systems. Mm -hmm. So that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is really uh, take a stochastic system. Does it have a coupon operator associated with it? And you know the, the way I've defined it back in 05 is certainly does. Now in a stochastic system, if let's say we are in discrete time from a single point, you can jump to many different points, not to a single one, right? Because mm -hmm. the jump forward is random. So what you do is you take an observable again, just like you do in Koopman theory, in regular Koopman deterministic theory, and you observe the value of all of the function over all these places where the, the next step is. And then you take an expectation, you take an average mm -hmm. over the observation, and you again get an operator. Mm -hmm. So again, you're taking an observable and you're, you're essentially producing a new function by this operator that provides you with the average values of what is going to be observed in the next step. Mm -hmm. the, the beauty of it is that, of course, this description now includes deterministic dynamical systems, because if you just take your expectation to be a delta, you know, over a delta measure, as to where you're jumping, then you get the deterministic system. And there is really no patching. You, mm -hmm. you, can, you can easily slide from deterministic setting to continuous setting. So what happens then is you can say, well, you know, if the spectra are the same, are the system, are the stochastic system and the deterministic system same in some sense? And that's something that I kind of proposed in a in a 2005 paper that that one should be. You know, one could model even nonlinear dynamical systems uh, with 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 an underlying linear structure, even when they are chaotic, with an underlying mm -hmm. linear structure plus noise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in our, our prior discussion, you mentioned uh, havoc by by yep. the Washington group, and in fact, that you know is is an attempt to realize that idea. That, that mm -hmm. I described in, in 2005 paper. They, they came to it independently, obviously. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but uh, it, it's an attempt to realize that idea that chaotic dynamics can be described as deterministic plus some noise. But one has to be very careful as to what is lost in the story. Mm -hmm. What is lost is now you have really lost the individual, the ability to recover individual trajectories. Because individual trajectories of the stochastic system are going to be different. Despite the same spectrum, they are going to be different than an underlying deterministic system, right? Mm -hmm. In general. Yep. And so for long-term prediction, for those kinds of analysis, um, uh, those ideas are, are good. And mm -hmm. as, as I said, as a, as a predecessor, we pursued them a while ago, just saying, well, okay, if you want to model a chaotic dynamical system, you can put on some structure that is deterministic and then add stochasticity. If you look at others who have pursued the same idea, you know, Maida at Courant, and then I think Dimitri Janakis was also playing with these types of ideas and ultimately came to Koopman operator theory as, mm -hmm. as a way of developing these these ideas, you know, in, in a rigorous, in, in a fully rigorous form where you really have an underlying deterministic dynamical system, but you're modeling it as a stochastic one. Mm -hmm. Right. Still a very interesting topic, I should say. Right. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. Um, I have two questions. The first one is going back to what you mentioned about the, 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 the beginning of ergodic theory. Um, you said uh, Birkhoff is, is, uh, is a predecessor of von Neumann's work, right? Uh, so uh, it was it was concurrent really for okay. Neumann uh, was but for Neumann was uh, pursuing the theorem in the mean and uh, and at the time claimed that that's all you need because in statistical mechanics you just need things in Hilbert space and everything is good uh, Berkhoff proved the theorem in the context of a single trajectory Okay. The ironic thing is, despite the fact that you know the, the genius of level of von Neumann said, well, we don't, you know, nice work, Garrett, mm -hmm. but uh, but we don't need anything more than in the mean. We wouldn't have any modern 
uh, Koopman operator theory from data, data driven one, if we didn't have Berkhoff's theorem. Okay. All the results that I did since my thesis on, on you know, general, generalized Laplace analysis type uh, results really rely on the fact that you can prove ergodic theorems <clears throat> along individual trajectories, mm -hmm. you know, point, point wise. And so von Neumann was wrong in that case. Right. Wrong, so, wrong judging judging the value, not wrong in proving the theorem, wrong in judging uh -huh. the value yeah. of what pointwise of what pointwise uh, results provide. We we wouldn't be able to claim, you know, results with probability one today if we didn't have mm -hmm. the the Barkov. Okay, so there's still, I mean, it's not like Koopman and therefore von Neumann are canceling out relevant things no, for. No, no. No, 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 absolutely not. But for, for uh, the analysis that we're doing today, we're very often, as I said, you know, in a jet engine, you have a single probe. In an engine, yep. you're getting a single stream of data along a single trajectory. Therefore, that von Neumann is not enough. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Von Neumann's mean ergodic theorem is not enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, and... Uh, so would you say in general, because uh, I mean, uh, I would say individually, but also science, I would say, because of its uh, nature to, to, to the, the willingness to, to understand, to predict. Um, I find it difficult to give up the single trajectory perspective, even in chaotic dynamical systems, because it doesn't make sense in some sense that, that we have a dynamical system and we are not able to predict it. Uh, to integrate it. I mean, the, the idea that a system can be non-integrable and, and deterministic at the same time is really difficult to grasp. Um, do you think we should get rid of this perspective uh, and and go into uh, a qualitative description or we can not give up uh, to have a single trajectory description of chaotic dynamical systems? Well, look, uh, the, the issue with individual trajectories in chaotic dynamical systems is of course that it, it, it's a pragmatic issue. Like if you, yeah. if you knew the initial conditions um, arbitrarily well, then of course you can make arbitrarily good predictions. <clears throat> so the, the, the question is really what is useful. Yeah, right. That, and so let, let me say the following. Suppose that we find an observable that starting from a trajectory that has sensitive dependence on initial conditions is still predictable over a much longer time span than the Lyapunov time scale. Mm -hmm. Now you get a combination, right? Because you know that to start with, I mean, that's what chaotic dynamical systems theory teaches us that you cannot do it for arbitrary observables. You're going to get exponential divergence pretty much or anything. But of course, there is an observable in which you can predict for all time, right? It's the constant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I'm ridiculously simplifying the situation, but I'm making a, point, a larger point. So, so you can keep the trajectory point of view provided you restrict your question or rather uh, uh, give a question that the trajectory point of view can effectively answer. Mm -hmm. That's my point, right? Yeah. So you don't abandon, and I certainly never did, my, my approach to dynamical systems theory is an amalgamation of geometric single trajectory methods and uh, operator theoretic approach. I certainly never abandoned that, mm -hmm. but but I'm looking for the benefit that you can get from operator theoretic approach when you lose the benefits, all mm -hmm. you know, some of the benefits of the of the single trajectory approach. Hopefully, hopefully that explains at least yeah, yeah. what how, how how I feel. I'm I'm very very far from saying um, abandon yeah, yeah. the single trajectory approach. That, that's 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 not what I'm saying. I'm saying you can get pretty substantial benefits by looking at an operator theoretic approach mm -hmm. yeah, combined indeed. with the geometric one. Yeah. 
Right. And I'm also thinking if there's, I mean, probably it's been explored already, but the the implications of this perspective on complex systems and uh, uh, I've been fascinated by the results of the Giorgio Parisi, the Nobel Prize in Physics, yeah. 2021. Um, yeah. Whether this operator perspective could, could be used even for stochastic systems to, to identify critical transitions, stochastic resonance, uh, things like this. Um, yeah, so there is, there is already some work that has been done on, for example, bifurcations, mm -hmm. identifying bifurcations from... Um, uh, from an operative theoretic point of view. And the reason why I think that's fruitful is that you don't really need a prior reduction. If you're going directly from data, for example, mm -hmm. you can identify bifurcations and, and critical behavior simply by watching the operator go, you know, change the parameter and the operator changes its spectrum. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, when you have the, the, the critical type transition, the spectrum actually for a moment for that parameter value becomes continuous. Even though the system is very much, you know, point spectrum, mm -hmm. at that point, uh, the critical transition, um, the, the spectrum becomes, uh, becomes continuous. And that I think is really, really interesting, right? Because again, you have a, you have a, a phenomenon that you can characterize from a trajectory point of view, viewing it in simple models. And when you connect it to an operative theoretic approach, now you suddenly have a tool that allows you to generalize that to literally an arbitrary um, setting, dynamical setting, where you can also identify the universality in systems by contrasting their spectrum mm -hmm. so that the feomorphism that we started or you know or memory in, in, in lighter situations just a, a topological conjugacy mm -hmm. it can tell you something about whether two systems are the same and they have some level of universality because the the, the Koopman spectrum itself is the universality class right mm -hmm. all the mm -hmm. systems that have that have some level of conjugacy are in the same quote unquote universality class, the spectrum is going to be the same. The eigenfunctions won't, but the, the spectrum is going to be the same. So yes, I see a lot of connectivity mm -hmm. here. Not enough work has been done um, mm -hmm. on going to the types of systems that, that Professor Parisi uh, um, studied, but I, I believe that's, that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. And it seems what, when you said about the bifurcation, the, the moment in which basically the, the, the system appears chaotic in a certain value of the parameter at the bifurcation. A, a very interesting point. It is not necessary for a system to be chaotic to have continuous spectrum. Okay, yes. That ah. was another question. So, okay. So, so if, you know, typically, or, or rather, there is the other way around. If the system is chaotic with certain, you know, technical conditions on it, it's going to have continuous spectrum. Um, and uh, you have to define the spaces to be precise and so on and so forth. Uh, here we're talking about systems like x dot is equal to x squared. They have no chaoticity to them, but you cannot represent oh, them with yeah. a nice spectral expansions because that would mean that the behavior of the trajectory is exponential in time and it's not And x is equal to x squared things blow up in finite time. Mm -hmm. So it's super exponential. So you cannot describe it with a simple uh, spectral expansion. And the consequence is that there is continuous spectrum. Right, okay. Yeah. So, so th that's- So every way. chaotic system has a, a continuous spectrum and not the other way around. The other way around. And, and so this is a very important question because this is a cause of confusion out there. I just wrote a paper a couple of years ago where I showed you know that integrable systems of the type that I think you're interested in, in celestial mechanics, the type that are described in, in, in you know, uh, Moser's book, mm -hmm. Celestial Mechanics, uh, these systems that are action angle systems, but they're not, not harmonic. Yeah, um, right. In Koopman, in Koopman world, they have continuous spectrum. And the reason for that is that every single trajectory has its own frequency of rotation. Mm -hmm. 
And <clears throat> so on every single frequency, you can put a trajectory, you can put a delta function that corresponds to, to that trajectory uh, with a sinusoidal shape, you know, the mm -hmm. harmonic shape that is actually going to behave like an eigenfunction, but it's not because it's, it's a delta, right? It's mm -hmm. concentrated on a, on a trajectory. So uh, a zero measure set in, okay. uh, in, in, the, in the state space. And so it's not in the Hilbert space. And so you actually have continuous spectrum there with a perfectly, with a perfectly, you know, integrable system. Mm -hmm. And 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 indeed, if you go from a single trajectory and measure the spectrum, you will get point spectrum. You have to combine um, uh, all of these trajectories spectra together to understand the spectrum of the operator. Mm -hmm. Now. Integrable systems from an operator theoretic point of view are not innocent, right? If you take a function that is, for example, a, it's, it's one in the direction of the action, yes? Mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then over a finite, over a finite uh, width, and then it's zero everywhere else. So imagine mm -hmm. a function is kind of like a block between two different, uh, two different actions. And then it's zero everywhere else, right? So it, mm -hmm. it defines segment. And now I've vected forward. Some elements of that function are going to go faster mm -hmm. and some slower. And you're going to get basically, you know, a mixed um, a field of ones. Mm -hmm. The function was one on that segment of ones and zeros over a long time. That's just going to happen algebraically in time. It's not going to happen exponentially. But you see that you get some kind of a, um, a um, complex dynamics there mm -hmm. in the in the functional uh, space, and that's due to continuous spectrum, really. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's clarifying. Thanks for me because I had this confusion about chaoticity, continuous spectrum. Uh, yeah. What's what? Uh, What's necessary for something to be true, and what's sufficient? So this kind yeah, of yeah, I, I thought there was some <clears throat> there was some uh, confusion about that in in the field. So I actually wrote wrote up this example. You know, the the technical aspects of this to, to prove it is not. I mean, you, you do have to work a little bit. Uh, so maybe that's why the confusion was out there because uh, because it's not maybe post facto everything is obvious, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to come up, uh, it's not clear coming from down um, but yeah so uh, so let's say um, going back to saying in this moment in the bifurcation in which there's no chaoticity but there's this continuous spectrum sounds a lot similar to the Avoc perspective so the time delay embedding uh, combined with Koopman uh, in which the, this controller this this external input that's making you go making you jump let's say qualitatively uh, and that looks kind of like a critical transition. Not sure that's true. Maybe I'm. I'm not sure the connection is is explicitly there. I I, I view uh, that aspect more as what I talked about before, which is that there is some structure mm -hmm. in on the attractor, and that there are events that are driven by by noise that that kind of spoil that structure. Um, in the in the example of uh, you know bifurcation. Um, you really have regular dynamics. The, mm -hmm. the aspect of, of uh, a change, the aspect that changes there is really that you don't have an exponential representation. So it's a, it's a little bit different in spirit. I don't think that okay. x dot is equal to x squared you should be representing as a coherent part of noise. Right, right. And I, I don't think that that particular connection, well, at least, from where I stand right now, but yeah, yeah, no, it's not. It, it was not explicit there. I, I was just thinking, uh, yeah, reading yeah. things. Um, yeah, and uh, a question about, let's say, uh, your, I would say, philosophical perspective. Uh, does God play dice, as uh, Einstein famously said? Is nature yeah. deterministic? Is it stochastic? I mean, because we are talking about bringing this quantum mechanics perspective, <clears throat> classical mechanics. Well, this is um, 
This has been actually an interest of mine for the last uh, five, six years, because the, the question, so let me go roundabout, right, to that question. The question that really interested me, shocked me to a certain extent, that Kupan and von Neumann themselves didn't observe the following, or maybe they did, and they didn't, you know, they, they didn't think it's fruitful. So let's see. Mm -hmm. So if a dynamical system has an operator associated with it, and you can do analysis based on that operator. And if one believes that what we are observing as we walk around this earth is a dynamical system, mm -hmm. even as we are observing quantum effects, uh, the idea would be there is a dynamic, so postulate that there is actually a deterministic dynamical system behind it. Mm -hmm. There must be an operator associated with it, yes? Mm -hmm. So that operator somehow has to be equivalent to Schrodinger when you're not relativistic. Fair? No. If not, so what I'm trying to say is that the Kuhlman operator really provides you with a unique litmus test. So if there is a deterministic dynamical system, then there is an operator associated with it. And that must be equivalent to whatever quantum operator is, is operating, mm -hmm. right? Yep. To give you probabilities. Yeah. Um, now, of course, we, you know, in probabilities, we're talking about the adjoint. But if you go forward, just take the dual of Schrodinger and, mm -hmm. and, and you get something that you know, should be related to Koopman. So if you adopt that, then you can go ask, well, can I invent a dynamical system that has a um, that has a Schrodinger equation as a as a consequence, for example, mm -hmm. or and Dirac. Turns out that exists. So um, I actually gave a talk recently at at a physics colloquium in 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 Germany that you can actually look it up on, on my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. okay. it's, it's one of the it's one of it's it's in one of the playlists. On, uh, on transfer operator approach to relativistic wave function. Okay. So you can actually derive this in a full relativity context and you get an equation that when you assume that you're at non-relativistic speeds, you actually derive Schrodinger. Mm -hmm. So the answer to the question is, is there a dynamical system that produces the Koopman operator equivalent to quantum mechanical, you know, um, a backward operator? The answer to that is yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's all I can say from a from an entirely rigorous point of view. But as you can imagine, that leads me to answer no. God doesn't play dice mm -hmm. because I can see that everything that we are seeing can be realized by an underlying underlying you know dynamical system that's also mm -hmm. associated with perhaps a field that has its own dynamical behavior. And the reason why we are seeing what we're seeing is really the quote unquote randomness right. in, in those fields, but they do have their own dynamics. We just don't, we just don't know it. Mm -hmm. That's where I stand now. Mm -hmm. This is uh, difficult having just watched the last Spider-Man movie because, you know, this, I would didn't imply, see it. this would imply that the multiverse doesn't exist. Ah, yeah. The, okay, okay. I saw that. One. The, you mean the cartoon, right? The no, there is actually a there is actually a movie, live movie, in which the whole premise is this. Um, ah, right. Movie. Also the, in the movie, right? Yes. It's famous I, 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 interpretation I of quantum mechanics that says that you know we there are multiple. Right. And uh -huh. it's, this point of view says no, not really. It's more along what Einstein and Schrodin, Schrodin, you know, Schrodinger uh, himself thought. Um, Schrodinger never really accepted the uh, probabilistic interpretation. Mm -hmm. He, he yeah. tried to find the deterministic underlying concept right. for a long time. My, my point is that the right framework within which to analyze that is the question that I just asked. Mm -hmm. or, or rather, you know, is there a deterministic dynamical system that gives you the same equations? Now, if you look back at Bohm and the de Broglie, then mm -hmm. you will see that same idea was answered in that sense. The proposal that I have 
is a little bit different. It doesn't have any of those pilot waves and hidden mm -hmm. variables like that. Um, so yeah, the proposal that I gave, give is different. And that is basically that we are, we might be looking at the trajectories of a dynamical system through a field. Like when you're looking at a coin at the bottom of the pool mm -hmm. and the wave field on the top is kind of spoiling your view. And so the coin seems to be moving. The only reason you know it's not is that your brain tells you it's a coin. I know what this is, it's not moving, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the, the field is giving you the, the, that randomness and the field itself has an equation associated with it. So yeah, I have a different proposal and, uh, but it turns out to give you know, the classical equations of, of quantum mechanics. I'm, I'm writing a paper on that now, okay. but the, the talk is already online, so. Oh, okay, yeah, I will check it. Um, and it's also interesting, I mean, then I have another, let's say, philosophical question. But before that, I'd like to mention uh, that I, I stumbled upon this work by Bruno, which is a, a celestial mechanicist in Princeton. And, and he, he did a work on uh, trying to put together Schrodinger uh, equation with uh, uh, ballistic capture. So let's say critical transitions in some sense mm -hmm. in uh, celestial mechanics. Um, and so it, I think it would be interesting now to, to approach the same paper with this perspective that, that you just mentioned. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think the answer is somewhere there. It's not a complete answer because, of course, you could have a deterministic realization. You could also have a stochastic realization. We just talked about it, right? Mm -hmm. so you could have something like a havoc point of view and you could have a purely deterministic point of view. And perhaps our measurements are not capable of distinguishing yep. between. So it ends up being just a belief. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, we, we, we do have a deterministic theory that, that is trying to couple the two, which is string theory. And one thing I can tell you, and if you watch my talk, you will see it, that actually there is a point of contact. If you assume that string theory is correct, you will find that this theory coming directly from this transfer operator, Koopman operator point of view is um, matches it. So it, it does mm -hmm. have a prediction that matches the one that the string theory would make. And that's very interesting to me because, because that, kind of gives additional, a little bit of an additional strength. Mm -hmm. I should say that because of the presence of this observation field, it's not the Koopman operator, but something that's called the weighted Koopman operator that I, that I derived in that case. Okay. Um, so, it's, so, so maybe that's why Koopman and von Neumann, because if you look at harmonic oscillator, of course, from a Koopman perspective, you're looking at the nonlinear observation of harmonic oscillator, you will get the base frequency omega mm -hmm. twice in the spectrum, twice the base frequency, three mm -hmm. times and so on. So n times omega, right? Mm -hmm. If you're looking at the quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator, you're going to get that one half, mm -hmm. right? H bar omega. So there is a part right. that is n H bar omega that is just like Koopman, right? Spectrum. I'm not because following you, but okay. It's just a nonlinear observation. But there is another part, and that comes from the weighted weighted Koopman operator. So it's not it's not a pure Koopman okay. operator. Right. So maybe that's why they you know they didn't they didn't quite get there. Right. I'm guessing yeah. it would be nice to have them around. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the philosophical question was the following. Uh, so you said there's no multiverse. If if God doesn't play dice, then there's no multiverse. Yeah. But then if I mean I'm not even sure what the premise of the recurrence theorem is. Do you need to have an Hamiltonian system a measure preserving? I'm not sure. A measure preserving. Measure You're preserving. talking about the Poincaré. Poincaré. Yeah, yes. Because uh, I've, I've been thinking recently about the connections between Poincaré's recurrence theorem and uh, Nietzsche's uh, eternal, eternal return, something like that. In his philosophy, he argues that time is circular and not, and not linear. So if, if, the, if, if the, the everything, I don't know, if, if nature is deterministic and is also measure preserving, then there may be in some, I mean, it's not that there's, there's the multiverse, but this thing is gonna happen. Well, recurrence, I mean, this, this is quite an interesting question and I'm, I'm probably out of, you know, getting a little bit out of my depth here because of course one has to study these things very carefully. 
But um, I don't know if you know this, but Kurt Gödel mm -hmm. has provided a solution to Einstein's equations of general relativity that, in which the recurrent time shows up. Okay, no, I, I didn't know. I, so, I knew Gödel just for logic. So Einstein's equations don't disallow this possibility of recurrent time. And so that's where I'm going to stop because that's a precise <laughs> answer. Yeah. And it, 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 it just means, well, we don't know. Mm -hmm. there, there is a solution. There is a cosmology that allows for recurrent time. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so uh, that would not be multiverse. multiverse. I mean, that, that, there you're correct. It wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't collide with anything I said. It would just mean that there was another moment in time when things looked very, very similar, but slightly different, right? Yeah, and they would different. end up yeah. evolving and they would end up evolving in a very, very different direction because supposedly you have sensitivity to initial conditions. Right. So th that's actually an interesting possibility as, as I was, you know, working, I, once again, I was working on a very specific technical question, which is, can you have, a deterministic dynamical system may be modulated through an observation that gives you the same equation as the Schrodinger. Mm -hmm. And uh, the answer to that is yes, not in the uh, not in in the broadly you know, bomb sense of pilot wave in a in a different way. So it's really a pure dynamical system, unmodulated, mm -hmm. but, but it's observed through a certain field. So I worked on that, and the answer there is yes. Now <clears throat> that begs the question as, you know, what with multiverse now? And your suggestion is an interesting one, which is, okay, if you had recurrent, recurrent time, then it would look like multiverse. It would look like you, you have a different universe, but it's just the same universe. Well, a similar universe. Yeah, the, the, the key is that it's similar, not the same. Uh, right. Uh, we are, we're, as I said, a little bit out of the technical, uh, domain, but in in fact, you know um, what we stated so far is just technical. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like those kinds of solutions do exist. A an an ex, you know a, an excellent question is whether one can ever do experiments or observations that would that would um, provide some kind of mm -hmm. a, some kind of a proof of that. That, that that is unclear.